the search for one-dimensional, very simple correlations, one drug, one clinical effect in all patients is horrendously obsolete. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we're talking with Peter Huber. He's the author most recently of The Cure and the Code, How 20th Century Law is Undermining 21st Century Medicine. Peter, thanks for talking to us. My pleasure. Uh, let's talk about the advent of uh, kind of molecular level medicine and uh, the ways in which kind of existing regulatory apparatuses get in the way of that. Talk about the intense personalization of medical uh, kind of technology that you're advocating in the book. Well, uh, to begin with, molecular medicine has been here as long as people have been trying to ha have drugs. I mean, drugs are, operate down at the molecular level. They're molecules interacting with other molecules. Um, uh, until very recently, it was treated as a, as a science of one hand clapping. You could control the, the, the drug's chemistry, but nobody could probe in any depth what was going on in the patients. In, uh, in a particular individual. Well, well, right. In one or, yeah. or many. Okay. I mean, we just couldn't see what was going on down there. We, we were lucky if we even saw microbes until quite recently, and viruses were even more difficult. You know, in our, in our generation, we've acquired the ability to see all, everything down there, and that transforms molecular medicine beyond recognition. It means you can design drugs to, to treat molecules, which and, is what they do. And I mean, what you're calling for, I mean, in a lot of ways, uh, you know, the, the span of the past several centuries has been towards more individualized understanding of in, you know, people, of knowledges, of societies. I mean, you're talking about using genomics and other things so that we can actually match a, a drug uh, with a particular patient. Yeah, this is not a policy question. I mean, the science of drugs is molecules interacting right. with other molecules. You just can't escape it. That's where the science really happens. Okay, this is, I'm not the first to right. recognize this. Uh, until very recently, we couldn't do that science properly, okay? And so we build up this big apparatus that uses surrogates, says, well, let's throw the drug at a person, and if they somehow recover and their clinical symptoms change, which are way up here, not down at the molecular level, uh, we'll say the drug is good, and if it doesn't work consistently well, out with the drug. Uh, it turns out that there's a lot of diverse chemistry down there. Uh, your body is not quite the same as mine, and your disease, even if it has the same clinical symptoms, may be quite significantly different from what is superficially the same one in, in my body. Before we get to the regulatory structure, how far along are we in terms of pharmaceutical companies being able to really say, okay, they're looking at your, your molecular chemistry, and here is how we're going to tweak a particular drug to work most effectively on you. Well, a, a very substantial fraction of, of the pipelines out there today uh, is, is probably somewhere between 30 and 50 percent are now genomic in some respect or other. So what, where, where are the real choke points in the process of developing this? How much of it is on the, uh, the kind of medical establishment side? How much of it is on the regulatory side? And how much of it is that patients um, either don't understand this or are kind of worried about this type of experimentation. Well, let's start with the part that we've become astonishingly good at, and I think many people don't realize this. We are very good at designing targeted drugs now. We have two very good technologies for doing that. One is called structure-based design, which is basically what it sounds like. Uh, you, you get a very good biochemist or increasingly a very good supercomputer. You show them the molecular target, maybe taken from a cancer cell or an HIV viral particle, and you say, whack this, and, and they, can, they can build a molecule that'll do that if they meet one-on-one. -on -one. But it's getting the drug from here to that point in your body, lots of things can happen. Livers can metabolize it, your immune system can go haywire, your kidney can be poisoned. And so you, you've got a multi-dimensional problem from the get-go. And it used to be assumed, you know, in fact, you'll find a lot in the literature, all our bodies are 99.9% .9 the same or something like that, genetically speaking. That is ancient history, that kind of teaching. They've been looking at smaller and smaller variations in our genes. There's a tremendous amount of genetic diversity underneath us, and that, of course, frames how the diseases progress and whether how drugs work. And so then, I mean, so there, there are immense technical difficulties in terms of really getting this stuff right. The, 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 the big challenge is now basically reverse engineering human bodies. It is, a, it is understanding the complex biology of, of cancers and neuro, neurological diseases and so on. We are developing an enormous amount of durable capital here as we, and the way you work that out, uh, it, or certainly one way, is to gather a whole lot of molecular data and clinical data and put it in huge databases and then unleash the, the, the people who are very good at this, which are the digerati. They, you know, Google and Microsoft do this all the time looking for patterns in very complex data. 
they but decide now to. it's I mean talk a little bit about the regulatory restrictions yeah. that are keeping this from happening because online you know when we're talking about data it seems you know it's easier to do than when you suddenly when you're talking about medicine well to start with it the the analytical the the, the cal computational tools we've got them now okay we, we, we can do those calculations for very complex systems Andy Grove actually wrote a little op-ed in science a couple of years ago saying we can do it, we've got to get beyond, and this gets to the other part of your question, what he calls the FDA's tyranny of the averages, okay? Um, w Washington cannot handle this complexity. Uh, the FDA has archaic and, and inadequate uh, IT systems, okay? Um, they've, they've, uh, they still enter data manually in some instances, their offices don't talk to each other, and they just don't have this kind of expertise. You find that at Google and, and among people who do big data all the time. We've, we've got those tools. The FDA is still very much locked into the old model saying, when, to validate a drug, we want to see the drug prescribed in the standard way, and we want to see, you know, predictably producing a desired clinical effect, okay? So and, and talk, talk a little bit about the ways around that, because this, this is a gigantic clash, and it's really, you know, the, the clash is happening over the human body, which is wasting away from various diseases and disorders. Um, you talk a bit about how in the, uh, I guess in the 80s and 90s, activists, uh, HIV activists, were able to kind of jumpstart or route around uh, FDA, typical FDA approval processes. Is that the best model for kind of changing the regulatory it, structure? It, it was very good in its time, okay? The, 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 the gay community had a tremendous impact for a while, okay, until the drugs arrived and then the FDA began to back off. But, but basically, it, it comes down to this. this the search for one-dimensional, very simple correlations, one drug, one clinical effect in all patients is horrendously obsolete. That is bad. That is, that is basically that kind of averaging. I, I think you can put this, it's not too strong to say if you demand drugs perform that way, we will not cure many of the serious diseases we're now facing because they aren't single, you know, one cause, one effect, one drug diseases. They just don't work that way. You're asking for the biochemically impossible. The FDA still generally requires that. Now, That's is, its norm. Is that because the FDA is willfully uh, ignorant or is it, I mean, is it an institutional thing? Like, why, how, do we, how do we route around the FDA well, then? Well, uh, Treat it as a, a, a virus that we can Well, well that's, that's a more a political question than it. Look, in the 1990s, it, the disease was so frightening. It was killing so many young and sympathetic victims, right. you know, notwithstanding all the talk about there being discrimination and bigotry. Right. There was plenty of that, too, but I'll tell you, there was a consensus that spanned the end of the Reagan administration, Bush won, and most of two Clinton terms that said, we just got to get these drugs out. And the FDA itself wrote a bunch of rules that actually, you know, uh, carved fast track tunnel, accelerated approval tunnels through, it, mm -hmm. through its own regulations. Uh, they had the benefit of something called the Orphan Drug Act, uh, enacted in 1984, that allowed them very flexible licensing. There was a lot of off-label use of drugs, and, I mean, they started down exactly the right path. And I'll tell you, if they had said, gee, this is working, and formalized it, mm -hmm. and, and updated it as we got uh, better more targeted drugs and better analytical tools, we would be a decade or two ahead of where we are today uh, uh, on uh, curing some a lot of intractable diseases. And in one way, uh, the the best hope to jump starting or pushing ahead with this is actually to give more information to individuals as opposed to government uh, authorities or even pharmaceutical companies. It's, you know, the fact that I, I actually think there's a First Amendment problem when the FDA walks out and says, hey, you, you know, Hubie, you're not allowed to read your own genome, and to, uh, from, at least not by a company who is giving you unapproved statements about what that genome implies. The FDA doesn't know what it implies either, right. so I don't see, and I don't see why I should have to wait for them to say this is the correct interpretation of that data. I don't think, I think frankly there's a case headed for the Supreme Court on that one. I, I don't think, uh, people have fought the other issue, you know, can they regulate drugs? We're not going to win that in the Supreme Court, but our right to read our bodies, yes, I think we will. Well, that's uh, probably the most novel interpretation of the First Amendment uh, that I'll hear all week. It's, so, it's not, not yeah. so novel. The, yeah. Your right to read, you know, is as guaranteed as your, no, it really is. And, yeah. and, and since when, when did we lose our right to read our own innards, you know? Uh, yeah. I mean, the, that's great. Well, we'll leave it there. Thank you so much, Peter Huber, author most recently of The Cure and the Code, How 20th Century Law is Undermining 21st Century Medicine. Thanks so much for talking to Reason TV. I'm Nick Gillespie.